Hello and welcome to masterclass number eight. Masterclass number eight, finishing your portrait well. Wow, this has been a real journey. Um, it's, it's almost kind of sad that it's drawing to a close. I've, I've just truly enjoyed this time of teaching you, um, seeing your portraits in this portrait painting challenge in the group, um, all the emails I've been getting, so many people responding. Uh, so many people taking their time and investing in themselves and in others um, to take their portrait painting skill to the higher level, uh, painting portraits with the talent God has given them, enriching and beautifying the world in a unique way. And again, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, taking your time um, on this challenge and working with me and being willing to just take a risk Put yourself out there maybe do something you've never done before many people in the group have never painted portraits before and it's just so encouraging to see them stepping out and using that gift God has given I want to go over a couple of things with you first of all first of all you might think it's too late to join the challenge here you might think well the portrait painting challenge is drawing to a close can I still join and I'm gonna say yes you can it's not too late to join um, the reason I put out this challenge here, of course, initially was because of the crisis we're going through for COVID-19. Many people are sheltering in place, uh, being quarantined at home and haven't had the chance to socialize, get together with other artists. And with this challenge, we've had a great community of people encouraging each other in our Facebook group, and it's just been delightful to see it. And that was my initial um, impetus for starting this challenge. But I designed the challenge to continue on. So that's why I've put up all these lessons here. They're not going anywhere. I made them completely for free. And just to be transparent with you, to be honest with you, uh, just share my heart. I was struggling at first with the thought of putting these lessons out here for free, doing a complete masterclass um, from start to finish with you know, a lot of time invested in each class and wondering, well, since I teach portrait painting for a living, are people going to purchase my courses anymore? What's going to happen here? And I just felt like God was giving me a nudge to say, trust in me. You know, Jesus was generous. You can be generous as well. And you can invest in others. And uh, just trust that I'll meet your needs. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this because this is the right thing to do. This is the right time to do it. And so these lessons are not going anywhere. Um, they're going to stay up permanently. You can access them. You can go ahead and do the challenge at your own pace. Um, if you decide to join the Facebook group, I encourage you to do that. You can say, hey, I'm doing the challenge. It might be May, it might be June, it might be July, it might be <laughs> even a different year as I record this in 2020. Um, that's okay. Just let people know I'm, I'm taking the challenge. I want to go and do something I've never done before. I want to pursue the talent God has given me and increase it and that and that's a good thing to do so you can take the challenge I encourage you to do that right now if you would still like to join it's not too late you can register at realisticacrylic.com backslash acrylic dash portrait dash painting dash challenge and when you register when you join you'll get the welcome kit which includes the complete supplies list so you know what kind of brushes and what kind of paint you need to paint along with us here in the challenge. Um, you also get the palette layout guide so you know how to array your palette colors so they don't get muddy and you can mix them efficiently. And then in addition to that you'll get the reference photo which has the grid and the photo without the grid so you know exactly how to lay out your sketch accurately and begin your, your, your portrait on a firm foundation. So uh, go ahead and join today. It is completely free. Um, realisticacrylic.com backslash acrylic dash portrait dash painting dash challenge. And I'll send out that welcome kit. And you'll also have access to all the previous lessons on one page. You can click and access each one, which uh, will be of great benefit to you. Okay, so here I want to share what some of the students who have been taking this challenge have been saying here about it. And this is what really encourages me to continue on teaching. Um, one of them says, thanks a bunch, Matt. You've been a blessing in my life and helped me uh, to do something amazing that I never would have been, uh, never would have imagined possible to paint portraits. Thanks again. And that was from a woman named Margie. 
Um, and then I have another uh, something else somebody, a student has said. I'm not going to mention her name just because of what she talked about, but she said, Matt Filio, you're the kindest man I know. I can't believe you're being so busy with the group lessons and have the time to answer me. I'm enjoying your videos very much and learning a lot. I'm actually working very slow because this technique is different for me. I used to work with oils, but due to allergy, I stopped many years ago and started with acrylics with which I have a love and hate relationship. But working on this project has really helped me a lot mentally and spiritually. You've done a miracle in my life, got me out of my depressed and sad mood and made me paint. Even my husband comments about my new attitude. I have no words to thank you. You have also motivated hundreds of people to do this project and that is also wonderful. I have also decided to get one of your class videos, whichever you suggest once the COVID-19 scare is over. I'm going to eventually get the courage and post my progress and then she continues on with some other things. Um, but I just thought it, that is just so phenomenal um, that this challenge has, has done a miracle in her life. And I'm not gonna actually give the challenge the glory, I'm gonna give God the glory and say that Jesus has used this portrait painting challenge um, to do a miracle in her life, to change her attitude. So God gets all the glory for that, but I'm so excited. I'm so excited that, you know, this challenge has spurred her on to do something. Um, obviously in the middle of a crisis like this, people can really worry and it can bring them down in discouragement and despair. Um, but working and creating and using your talent gets your mind off of negativity and it really can harness just the gift that God has given you and put you in a different frame of mind. And I'm so glad that that happened to this lady here. And God bless her for, for sharing that. And may she continue in that uh, new frame of mind. That's awesome. Um, I think we have one, one more here that I want to share. And uh, it says, Lesson 6 done. Well, as good as I can get it for now. Enjoying it more now. Thank you, Matt, for your great teaching. Thank you to the group for your wonderful, wonderful support to everyone. And thank you to the group for your wonderful support to everyone. And so that's hats off to you. You're watching this video, you're part of the group, and you've been encouraging your fellow artists. And uh, that's awesome that you've taken time, you know, to give somebody a thumbs up, give them a like, give them an emoji, uh, say a kind word about their painting. If they've asked for help, you've given them concrete advice on how to improve their portraits. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time to do that. That's awesome. And uh, with that, I'm just going to ask a blessing on this session. And I'm going to dive in here on this last particular class, finishing your portrait well. Father, I ask a blessing on this class here. I pray you'd help me to be able to teach the last aspects here of this portrait how to bring it home, so to speak, and do shading and details, um, and how just to capture those last few nuances um, as much as I can get within this time frame here uh, during the class to really show the students how to finish their portraits well. Father, bless each and every one of the students. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that you would help them to continue to use their talents, Lord, to glorify and honor you, to encourage others, to uh, be a blessing to others, to also encourage themselves by creating beautiful things, Lord, that you put on their heart to create. I pray that you would, um, if they're looking at doing this for a career, that you would open doors for them, that they could paint full time, um, provide everything they need, Lord, according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Bless this class. Father, thank you so much that we have the time to do this together. I pray you'd bless it completely in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're gonna dive right in here and you can see where the painting is at at this point. I'm gonna zoom in and I think we're gonna work on some of the flesh tones a little bit. At this stage here, we're gonna be kind of diving in and out all over the place. Um, so I don't have a step-by-step -step kind of procedure here. It's gonna be more of just touching little areas and adding nuances and details where they need to be added. Um, 
But uh, before I do that, I want to show you something here. So I have this uh, value checker tool, value checker tool, and this is another gift I'd like to give you. Um, the value checker tool is something that you can download when you're registered for the challenge. It's on the registration page, and you can click the link for it, download it, print it off. It just it fits on an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper, standard paper. And what this tool does is it helps you to measure your tonal values and make sure that you have your portrait accurate. Um, a lot of times, and I've seen this in our Facebook group, students think that their painting is too dark, but you'd be surprised if you hold up your value checker tool and compare your reference photo to your painting, you'll find out that it's not as dark as you think. You actually have quite a ways to go. Usually what it is, it's not that your values are too dark, but that they're not correct. You need to have certain values darker than others to make the ones that seem too dark appear correct because value is all relative. So I want to show you here um, with the value checker tool we've got some different tones here. We've got a, a warmer tone, a, a cool tone, a grayish tone, and then a different uh, warm tone on the bottom. And these you can use for flesh tones and these you could use for other colors. And I made them color just so it, it matches up and you can kind of gauge it easier. You know, if you just have grayscale, it's hard to tell. But when it's colored, you can really compare those um, different tonal values a lot easier. So let me show you how this works. After you print it off, you want to fold it on each edge like this. You know, so you can easily hold it up to your reference photo without any white disturbing what you're looking at. Okay, and basically we're looking at the warmer tones right now, but you could also use it, uh, you could use the bluish section for the uh, blue areas in the painting or grayish areas like the shirt that are cooler in tone. So that would work for that. And you could use the, the general neutral tone, this gray tone for the background. But uh, I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to zoom right in. I'm going to zoom right into the skin tones and we're going to compare this to the reference photo. My reference photo on the Kindle is a little at an angle so it's hard to see it, but um, I want to hold up, let's say the mid right here, and I'm going to hold it up to an area on my painting that seems to be similar in value. Okay, we're going to say, oh, right here. Where is it similar in value? Somewhere about here. And then let's hold it up to the reference photo and see where it compares. And we look in the reference photo, I don't know if you can see that or not, but from my angle it's substantially lighter. In other words, the reference photo is darker than this square right here. But when I hold it to my painting, they're almost the same. And so that uh, and actually, actually, my, my painting is a little lighter than this. Yeah, my painting's a little lighter than this. So that tells me that I actually could make this area darker. Even though it's starting to look quite dark to me, it could get darker. And if I look at the hat, for example, this dark area under the hat, um, right on the rim here, and I hold up the darkest tone that I have, and this matches pretty well you know this dark tone against my my painting but if I hold that to the reference photo the reference photo is darker so this actually could get darker yet it could get darker yet and you know when I varnish it that'll darken it a little more too but um, I would encourage you to use your value checker tool and you'd be surprised like even here on the light area of the face um, when I hold this tone right here, you know, that's matches pretty close. And I hold it to the reference photo and I see that, yeah, the reference photo is just a tiny bit darker. So this could get a little darker, but it depends on what spot I'm looking at. Some areas are lighter, some are darker. But I would use this to double check yourself just in a few areas that, um, might give you question where you're wondering if you have the values correct or not and that value checker tool will give you a lot of clarity it'll really open your eyes to where your values are at okay so now let's dive in here 
and I'm going to add some matte medium to my palette. Add some matte medium to my palette, and I'm going to start. Oh, let's see. Add a few glazes uh, to the face. I want to let's add a few details to these wrinkles here around the eye. And I'm going to take Romber Dark, mix with matte medium, a little bit of titanium white, a little bit of raw sienna. A little more matte medium, and how about some alizarin crimson, just to warm it up. And I'm just going to test it and see how those colors look. Now the titanium white is just to help it smooth out a little more. I'm going to add just a little more titanium white. And a little more raw sienna, just to warm it up. Now let's take this color here and put it on the white card. You can see what we're dealing with. That's the actual color we have. Now I'm going to apply this on the canvas and see how it looks. I always like to test it before I really stick with it. And that does need to get a little darker. So take some Romber Dark and Alizarin Crimson to warm it up so it's not too grayish. And then let's add that just on the corner of this crow's feet wrinkle. I want to dive in really close so you can see that. And I'm just trying to see that shape there being created now. I'm going to add a little bit of burnt sienna and some titanium white, raw sienna, make a slightly lighter version of this mix. And I'm going to add that just below here on this next wrinkle. I'm also going to fan this out. So I'm getting a gradient. It's dark up here and it's fading out a little bit lighter. I'm going to add a darker gradient just above on top of this wrinkle. And I'm using very, very light strokes. Very light. And now I'm going to add a, just a thin line to the interior of the wrinkle. A little bit darker on this upper edge. I'm going to zoom in on the detail a bit. I'm going to use some matte medium to thin this mixture out, make it more translucent. And I'm just going to add a little bit of detail to the interior of his eye wrinkle. Um, Add a little bit of a glaze right underneath his eye, darken that area just a bit because it's in shadow from the upper eyelid fold. <clears throat> now there's a little wrinkle. Let's move the camera over just a bit to the right. I'm sorry to the, yeah, I guess just a little bit to the right. And I'm going to add this wrinkle across this transverse wrinkle um, across his uh, forehead, although actually it's between his nose and his lower forehead. And I'm just going to run that right across because that's a detail I need to have in there. I want to make sure it's in the right place. And it looks like it's just slightly above the upper eyelid fold here so it needs to come up a little higher than what I think. Or maybe the upper eyelid fold needs to come up higher, I don't know. But I'm going to add it right here. So I'm just barely, barely grazing the canvas. Now I'm going to use a little darker color. I was starting with light and I'm going to add a little bit of a darker color right in the center of it. And hopefully I can get most of this done in one layer. But it'll probably take a couple layers to do it. And it's okay. You don't have to do it all in one layer. If you make the habit of just taking bite-sized chunks out of your painting and think of um, building step upon step. You don't have to get it all done within one layer. You can come back and take maybe three, three, four opportunities to really get a detail in there. And that's okay. That's going to help you develop more nuances if you um, do the first layer and then come back again and add some more nuances to it. Darken a few spots within the wrinkle really adds a lot of depth 
and it makes a big difference in the overall painting. Now I'm going to just, like I said, skip around here, there, and everywhere, but um, let's see. I want to I want to get this shadow on his nose a little darker because I have, I think, a color on my palette that will work. And I want to employ that color while I have it here. So I'm just going to add that. Now I'm going to need to add a little more titanium white and then raw sienna to make it just a little more opaque so it covers better. Add a little bit of this alizarin crimson to that. And now let's go on top and see what we have here. It just makes it cover a little better when you have more opacity on it. And towards the end of the painting you will be adding some titanium white to your glazes. But make sure you don't add it in the very dark areas like the hat. Unless you're doing highlights. But on those darkest values you don't want to add titanium white. That would make it gray. But you can add it on areas that are more of a mid-tone. And that would be if you grab your value checker tool. Anything in the mid area on it. You can add titanium white to that. But as you get towards the darkest scale, you don't want to do it. So here and up, it's okay. There and back, it would not be. Um, so I'm going to add a little of the same color to the edge of his nostril and just darken that area a little bit. And now on the edge of this, this shadow, I need to smooth that out. It's not enough just to add that one layer. Now I've got to add a gradient to blend out of that. So I'm going to take titanium white, a little bit of Indian yellow, pyro red orange, or you could use cadmium. I'm going to mix that in to this current mixture. Add a little matte medium to thin it out. Test it. You want to, if you want to see what the color looks like, here's what it looks like on the white card. It's fairly orangish, but um, we need something that has a little luminosity because just at that junction where you have a dark value hitting a lighter value and it's on a warm colored surface, you'll tend to get these uh, warmer tones just at that point where the dark value hits the light value. And that's what I call the Tebow effect. Now, I don't mean Tim Tebow, the retired NFL quarterback. I'm talking about Wayne Tebow. We, Wayne Tebow was an artist from oh, about 50 years ago, a very famous artist that did uh, semi-impressionistic abstract paintings with a lot of realism as well. And he would have these very, very vibrant surfaces. And one of the hallmarks of Tebow's paintings is he would have like a, a white area where it was, you know, a woman in a bathtub, for example. And the bathtub was very white. And then you'd have, you know, maybe her clothing or something contrasting in a very dark value next to it. Um, or her hair was very dark against that white bathtub. And where the two would meet, where that dark hair would meet the white of the bathtub, he would add like these really intense colors like red and orange. And it would usually be a complementary color. Uh, maybe your hair is more of a greenish brown and then he'd have more of a reddish orange color up against that by the white of the bathtub. I'm just using a, an example where he had these candied apples on a table and where the blue shadows hit the white edge of the table he'd have orange right next to the blue um, and it would really give it a vibrancy um, and add a lot of energy to the painting. But what he was doing was he was exaggerating in an abstract way what actually occurs in nature. So again, if you were to study this reference photo, you'll see right around the edge of the nostril there, or I should say above the nostril, that little divot, there is that Tebow kind of effect. Where you can really see that, though it's just a little warmer. And that's what I'm trying to add here. And that's going to make your shadows more believable by adding, like I said, that slightly warmer color where the dark value hits the light value. You also see it on this side of the wing of his nostril as well. So let's do that. Let's add just that slightly warmer tone right there. Okay, now let's see if I can employ this 
anywhere else right here by his cheek and Part of the reason we're getting that warmer color is the reflected light coming from his mustache and his cheek and his shirt. And this is a very deep shadow, but it's not as dark as it could be because of the reflected light. And then it just gets warmer in color. So just in this spot right here, up against his nose, we're going to use that kind of reddish orange color. And I think that's going to really help. Also. Also, let's add that to the top right here on his upper lip area. We're going to add that right up here. And that's going to get just a little bit warmer on that edge if you can see that. And now I'm going to soften up this shadow here coming from his mustache. Take a little titanium white and a little raw sienna. And we're going to mix it into a glaze. A little more titanium white. I'm going to pull from this browner part of the mixture so it's not too intense. I'm going to test it. It should basically match the color I have and maybe be just a little bit lighter. So that's what you want to do. You want to match it. We're going more opaquely at this point. We're going opaque, but we're mixing some matte medium with it just to dilute the mixture so it's not completely opaque. It's going to be like 50-50 or even 75% um, opaque, 25% medium. And the medium also keeps the paint very fluid so you don't build up a lot of texture that can make it difficult to get a smooth blend. But what you want to do is you want to go over the shadows that you have, okay, that you've developed using the glazes, and you hit them with this semi-opaque layer, then you take a little titanium white and you mix up against your last area of color that you just put down, you lighten it and you, you see if it calls for a little warmer color, which in this case it does, and usually it will. So I'm adding some Indian yellow. I'm gonna pull right here and grab a little of that organic red orange or pyro orange that I set off to the side of my palette. And I'm gonna go on top and just blend out. I'm gonna meet the two together just on the edge and. Grab a little matte medium, thin it out a bit so it's a little more translucent. But I'm going to just blend out the edge very delicately, very delicately. And I might have to come back in and then uh, refine. I might have to go on top and say, you know what, I blended that out too much. It's too ambiguous. It's time to come back in and add more clarity to the shadows. And that brings up a different point. And the point is this, um, we might think that realism is always implied by having smooth shading and just having those gradual blends from light to dark and making everything very smooth. And it is very important to get smooth shading in your portrait. And we did a lesson just covering that aspect alone. However, there's areas of your portrait that need to have smooth shading and there's areas that need to have very crisp, delineated, sharp edges. And when you can notice the difference between the two in your reference photo and properly portray that on your canvas, that is going to really add huge, huge impact to your portrait painting. It's going to take you to the next level. Um, so really study your reference photo and see where you have those sharp edges, like these cast shadows, like the cast shadow here on his neck and then coming down from uh, the rim of his hat. That's a very sharp shadow. Uh, that's a cast shadow. Then you have the surface shadow coming across his cheeks where the form turns. You're turning the form and it's more of a gradual shift. And if you watch my critique video, I mentioned that in one of the portraits I critiqued, getting that difference between the harsh edges of the cast shadows and these soft shadows here, which is more of a surface shadow where his cheek is round and it's just a gradual shift from light to dark. And so, um, that's going to really make a big difference if you can see those areas, identify them, 
and intentionally paint them as they are. You don't want to exaggerate them, but just paint them as they look in the reference photo. Alright, so um, there's more I can do here. I'm going to work a little bit on his ears. Now the ears are probably an area we don't think about as being very important. And it's true, you know, the ears aren't the first thing somebody's going to look at. Well, when we're looking at somebody's face, we really don't look at their ears right away unless there's something strange with them that makes them very out of the ordinary. But let's face it, when you look at a man or a woman and you judge whether, you know, they're attractive or not, you're going to be, well, looking at their eyes, right? You're going to be looking at their eyes first, then maybe at their, their smile, their mouth. You might look at their nose next. Ears are going to be last. But, uh, you know, if somebody's missing their ear, that's, you know, that's uh, something that we would notice on their face. And the same thing with, with the portrait here. Um, the ears are still important. We want to make sure that overall, you know, the proportions are accurate and we have the lighting as it should be. We don't need to spend as much time on the ears as we do the other features because it's the other features that really identify a person as who they are. Uh, it really portrays their likeness and the ears very, very much secondarily. But I do want to work on the ears a little bit. And I'm just going to take some of these colors that I have floating around on my palette. Use a small round brush. This is what I've been using for most of this, a size 4. And I'm just going to go over the interior of the ear canal. I want to smooth it out. I want to add a little more organic red pyrrole orange. Again, you can use cadmium. That would be okay. And you might have to use a little more matte medium to thin it out because cadmium is more opaque. That would be the only difference. Maybe not the only difference. The color is a little different, but they're close. <clears throat> um, so we're going to just shade on the top of his ear a little bit and get this edge a little darker as it gets towards the hair. And there's a shadow coming under this upper lobe of the ear. I want to capture that. And then I want to get a darker shadow on the edge of the ear. So I took a lizarin crimson, also some raw or dark to tone it down so it's not too vivid. And I'm just going to add that glaze right here. And that's too, too transparent to use with this round brush, so I'm making, making it a bit more opaque by adding this secondary mixture where I had a little titanium white and raw sienna added in. But the reason I'm using the round brush is it just gives me a lot of precision. Again, if you remember the previous lesson um, where I talked about nations and states, as a metaphor for delineating, identifying where the shadows go, where the different shapes of the values go. This round brush really helps you to precisely place those value shapes, those tonal value shapes. So you look at your reference photo and you just say, um, this, this shape, there's a little shape here on the ear and it's like a triangle and I see it right there. And I'm kind of pinpointing it with the brush. And it needs to go right here in this place. And so it allows you then to put it just in that spot. Whereas if you were using, you know, a larger uh, flat edge brush, you wouldn't be able to get that, um, that shape placed right where you want it. You'd have to settle for something a little more ambiguous. And in doing so, even though it is easier to cover with a larger brush, in doing so, you're going to trade off on the realism. You're going to lose some of the realism, at least with this technique. Um, possibly you could make it work with other techniques, but um, I still think even with, with larger brushes, you're going to have some difficulty. The smaller brushes really give you that precision. Um, I want to I want to darken this shadow here coming from his earlobe, it's 
it's too too sharp in contrast it needs to have more of a gradation from it so I'm just pulling from this mixture here it's a little lighter and uh, it's going to take more layers than this I was hoping I could get more accomplished in this one layer but uh, sometimes the paint doesn't always behave and do what you want it to do and then you just have to say well we'll come back in another layer and we'll do it then so I'm gonna have to come back again and uh, just hit that with another layer that's alright I can be patient um, I want to hit the edge of the ear and just define that more we've got some pencil lines still kinda of showing through on the edge there and it's really time to close those out go over them this layer and this glaze is semi opaque so it is kind of covering over that a little bit and um, so I'm losing the pencil lines which is good alright I want to see if I can uh, just go over the edges a little bit now as you get towards the end of your painting you're going to want to look at the edges between your objects and really give your your figure your subject some good contrast you want them to really stand out from the background and the background is blurry so we want to intentionally redefine the edges because as you work on it with the glazes you start to lose the definition and I don't really worry about that definition of the edges until I get to the latter portion of the painting so I'm gonna kinda clean up some of these lines I'm gonna show you how to do that um, again we're gonna be using this round brush as size 4 and just giving it a huge workout here um, but let's you know what since I have this color handy let's define the edge of his shirt and I'm gonna need to zoom out a bit There we go. Let's define the edge of his shirt here um, against the shadow on his neck. So I'm going to pick this color here. It just looks good. You might ask, why are you picking it? Well, it just feels like it's the right one, just looking at it based on my experience. But you just have to test it out. I mean, really, you just have to test it out. And I'm going to test it right here. If it's too dark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull for my lighter mixture. You see how it's darker up on top? and it gets gradually lighter I'm just going to pull from this uh, lighter mixture if I feel that it's too dark I want something that's you know slightly darker than what I currently have and I want to define want to define the edge because in the reference photo that actually has a pretty harsh edge there and we're just going to define that a little bit We'll just blend it out into the rest of the skin tone by pulling from the lighter part of this mixture and just touching it up along the edge here and fanning it up into the rest of the mixture using kind of a cross hatching technique, you know, very light strokes. Wipe it a little bit with your finger. If you have enough layers down, you'll find it'll work just perfect or at least it'll be really nice because we never actually achieve perfection in this life but we do we do strive for perfection um, I'm gonna define the edge of the shadow just a little bit falling from his uh, chin onto his neck I'll just define that a little bit just using a little bit of the edge there okay that's good you know this shadow here has to get substantially darker this one uh, the one being cast by the collar of his shirt onto his neck so I'm gonna pull from this slightly darker mixture and just go on top of it this is much more opaque now and with the other layers beneath it it makes it very very rich I'm gonna let it dry and I'll come back in on top with another layer that nah tell you what I have enough layers underneath I can come in with a darker layer and we'll see 
see how that works. And we're just going to go on top of this with the same mixture with a little romb or dark added. And I'm just going to go along the edge. Yep, I'm just going to go along the edge. I'm going to wipe off what's on my brush on my palette. Now I'm going to blend the two together a little bit, just using some light strokes. And that's called wet on wet blending. So I, sh I showed you some different blending techniques from uh, using a dry brushing technique, using um, a segmented glazing technique, to um, using a dabbing technique or a dilution glaze. This is a wet on wet blending. This is what you traditionally do to blend if you're painting with oils where you have a workability time. And if you do this with layers underneath it and you have a glaze on top and you come in with a darker color, you actually can blend that quite well. You can blend that quite well. It's not too difficult to do as long as you have enough foundational layers underneath. Now if I tried to do this with a white canvas underneath, it would not work. But because I have all these glazes underneath as a foundation, I was able to come across and put on another glaze on top and then add that darker line just along the edge and uh, blend the two together. And this might not even be done. It still might have to get just a bit darker than that. But, but that gets me closer. It definitely gets me closer. All right. I'm going to spend another 10 minutes or so painting. And then we'll close this lesson down. Let's um, take some raw or dark and ultramarine blue, raw or dark, ultramarine blue, and let's define the edges of his hat. Since uh, that's what we've been working on here, I'm going to, let's see, I'm just going to define the bottom edge a little bit and the top edge of the rim of his hat. Now I'm making kind of a black color. And you can see it on the white card. It's pretty dark, fairly opaque at this point. So again, I told you when we started this that towards the end of the painting we would be getting much more opaque. And you can see that. Um, so I'm going to add just a little raw sienna because that's an opaque pigment. And a little bit of alizarin crimson so it's not too greenish. And I just want to go over the edge make something that flows really well. Let's add just a bit of titanium white only because the top half is a little lighter in value and it adds a little opacity to it. It's the only place you can do that if you're not doing a glaze but just more of a small area like this where you're defining edges. Then you can get away with adding titanium white to um, your layers but that's not meant for glazes. And this I don't really think of as, as much of a glaze as it is more of just a kind of a retouching a small area and defining edges. This is more of a detail work right here. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> now as I get to the dark edge, I'm going to need to redarken that. Romber dark, ultramarine blue, lizard and crimson. And I'm going to just define the edge of his hat here a little bit. I'm going to use the same color and define the bottom edge. Because these are areas where we do want some crisp definition to really differentiate the subject from the background. I want to pay attention to the shape and at this point I can adjust some things that I might have had off on my sketch. I'm just going to blend this into the main color of the hat. Just bring this up all the way into it. And I'm going to grab the darker color and just define that edge there against the upper part of the rim. And then also just going to define this top edge as well 
and it looks like the shape is a little different than what I had it sketched as. It kind of bows out a little bit more. There's a little more of a curve involved in it. So I'm using just short choppy strokes so I can really control the angle and I'm resting my hand on the canvas which is one of the things you can't do with oil painting that I love about acrylic is you can rest your hand on the canvas whereas if you were using oils you'd have to you know use the technique like this with your fingers or one of those mall sticks but I, I like that I can just rest my hand on the canvas and really get a great deal of precision and I don't have to worry about smearing anything yep that's some people like oils but uh, oils never work for me because I'm kind of a messy painter and I would walk away from painting with oils and man I would just have them on my hands and they'd be on my clothes and they'd be on my chair and they just get everywhere and uh, yeah I figured it's not gonna work for me and I, I dived into acrylics learned that glazing technique back when I was in that summer art camp in high school uh, taught by a college instructor and that set me on a course to paint with acrylics for my whole life and I haven't looked back since. I love acrylics. Um, now I'm going to keep adding some more shadows to the top and just blend across, just blend across here and I really want to get that definition between the band of his hat. So we're just getting some definition on the edge of the hat and you know I was mentioning this before but um, I painted portraits of rabbis for uh, a few years now for a client from Brooklyn and the client is very very particular and his his customers his client or I should say his clients because he resells these these paintings there. He's an art dealer. And they're very particular about their, their hats, these rabbis. You know, you can have their eyes off a little bit, the nose can be a little too large, or the mouth can be a little too skinny, or whatever. But man, you, you dare not get those hats wrong. You gotta get the rim just right, the top shape just right. <laughs> those rabbis, they're very particular about their hats and their beards. So. That's one of the things I've learned to do is to paint a lot of black hats and a lot of white beards. All right, um, just going to refine the edge here a little bit on the top portion of his hat. And just get the rim. I'm coming in with a slightly lighter version. I add a little bit of titanium white and a little raw sienna just to warm it up. I'm just going to add it along the edge. Oh, I think that's going to be too light. Let's darken that. And we're just going to add it along the edge here and just get that slight detail, slight detail of the edge of his hat. And here it blends into this area. I'm just going to go over it and blend that out very gradually. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right, now did I get this edge the way I want it? Maybe I can define that a little bit more, just get that shape a bit more accurate. All right, now I'm going to cut in along the edge here. And just to find the edge of his face using the same kind of color. it up a little bit. Add a little bit of raw sienna and I want to just glide that along the surface. And I'm just defining the edge and adjusting any of the shape of his cheeks and his chin that I might have had off from the original sketch. All right, I, I, before I call this uh, class done right now, I want to add one more glaze just to the right side of his hat. 
just a little darker over here. I'm going to need to add a little bit of Indian yellow to the mix just so it matches a little better. I'm just going to go over and that slight glaze right there. A little bit of Romber Dark, Ultramarine Blue. And we'll just blend that out a little bit. And then I'm going to darken the edge of the hat just a tiny bit as well. Just add a couple nuances right here. All right, I also want to show you one other thing here. Um, painting highlights on the skin tones. That's very important to get little nuances like the highlights on his nose and his cheek and chin. So for that we take titanium white and a little bit of organic red orange or cadmium red, if that's what you have. Basically just looking for a red and a yellow. Mix them together and you're going to make uh, kind of a very light white. So it's, it's almost white. Again I'll show you here on the white chart. You can see you can hardly see the color. It's very very close to white but it's just a warm white. And we're going to test that and put that right on top. Thin that out with some matte medium. Make it a little more translucent. We're just going to add that to the top of his nose. We're going to look for the bright spot on the uh, reference photo. See where it's at. I mean really don't just put it anywhere where you think it should go. Pay attention to where that bright point is. Does it line up with the top of the nose? Where does it line up vertically? Where does it line up horizontally? So really try to place that accurately. And I think it's maybe about here. You're, you're going to want to put it right in the middle of his nose, but don't do that. Really place it where it needs to be. And in this case, it's a little bit right of center. And it's a little bit below the shadow here. So I actually had it slightly off. It's probably more about right there. And I'm just going to get that very, very faint nuance. That adds a lot to your painting. You can also add a little bit of a highlight to the cheeks as well because we recognize they're getting some light too. I'm just going to add some highlights to those points. A little bit of a highlight to his lips. And a little bit to his chin because I see some lighter values right there. And then to the top of this wrinkle here, this crease between the middle of the chin where it breaks off into the lower part. And I can take this glaze and see if I can also just barely go over his cheek and see if there's any areas that are a little different. We don't want to make his cheek flat but we want to see if there's any lighter areas. It looks like maybe just in the middle it's a little bit lighter. We're adding that slight nuance, that slight nuance. Okay. All right, we'll step back and um, yeah, and I think. Uh, I think that's good. So, all right. All right. So now at this stage, we have what we would call maybe, maybe a finished portrait. Um, when I look at this and I think of the hours I put in and there's still some areas to resolve, more nuances to add. If I was on a tight deadline, maybe I could call it finished, but uh, I would like to put more work in on this. And that brings a, a good question up. Uh, when do you call a portrait done? When do you call a portrait done? I have four guidelines that you can use to determine whether you call a portrait done. 
and this is based off of a blog post I did at Realistic Acrylic Portrait School. Uh, but the first guideline that you would use would be, um, are you adding value? Are you adding value to the portrait? By adding additional layers, is it making enough of an impact that when people look at it, you know, not scrutinizing it with a magnifying glass, but where they just look at it and observe it, um, would your additional layers add more impact, more realism, more believability, more uh, life likeness to the portrait, more joy for the person who's going to hang it on their wall, or more joy for you if it's being hung on your wall? Um, these are things you want to ask. Also, if you're doing it as a commission portrait for a client, is the client really going to notice the difference? Um, if you think they will, then you know you're not done. You should add more layers. Um, the other guideline, the other guideline for determining whether the painting is done, are you making it worse? <laughs> if you start, you know, getting to a stage in your painting where you had something looking really good, and I'm not saying we're in the beginning stages because you have to work out of those mistakes in the beginning stages of the painting. We all do, but I'm talking about where you're towards the end and you had something looking really good like the nose or the teeth or the eyes had that certain twinkle and then you're like you know I want, I want to try to make that a little better and then all of a sudden you made it worse. Um, then you'll have to go back and fix it and restore it to what it was before you added that extra layer and if you have that happen a couple more times in your painting in different spots it's probably an indication that your painting is done and you're just overworking it. So that would be the second way of determining whether your painting is done. Are you making it worse? Um, the third way would be you hit the end of an unforgiving deadline. All right, Do you, Are you up against the wall on a deadline? I know as a commission portrait painter I am quite a bit. And uh, sometimes somebody needs a painting for Mother's Day or a birthday or Christmas and man, you better get that portrait done in time for the client. Um, and you might have the portrait maybe 80 to 90% done. You look at it and you say, I think this could get a little better. Um, I could add more detail to it. I could enhance it more, but I just don't have time to add more to it. And you could, you could be perfectionistic about it and say, I'm not going to give this to the client unless, unless this represents my very best work. You could do that. But then if you miss that deadline for the client and they were counting on having that portrait for Christmas to give to their loved one or for that birthday or for that anniversary and you miss that deadline, you're not going to help your business at all. And you're not going to be giving them your best work because in that client's mind, you didn't deliver anything to them and you disappointed them greatly. Um, so in that sense, it's better just to Give it to the client, even if it doesn't feel like it's finished, even it's, if it's 80 to 90% done, just give it to the client and they're going to be blessed. They might, they might like it. They might approve it and say, you know what, I love it. I love it. Or they might say, you know what, it just doesn't quite look like him. You need to add, I, I don't know what it is, but something in the mouth is off, something in the eyes is off. And for me, I've had that happen. And if that happens, I pray and I say, Lord, what did I miss on this painting? What do I need to do to get this likeness dialed in and he'll show me he'll show me um, but uh, yeah sometimes if you submit it too early that can happen but you have to take a chance especially if you've got that deadline staring you in the face um, okay so that's the third way to determine if your painting is done um, the fourth way would be again if you are painting on commission or if you're giving it as a gift or just giving it to somebody in, in general if your client or the loved one that you're giving this to approves it. If they say, oh, I love it. It looks just like Johnny. Oh, and maybe they have a tear in their eye and they're moved. Oh, this is so special. Oh, thank you so much. And you know they, that that's the moment you're waiting for. That's the moment. That's the reason why you've done this. That's the reason why you painted this portrait and you're painting portraits for a hobby or for a living. And if you have that client approval, they email you back, yeah, it looks just like them, or I love it, or even just I'm happy with it, well then don't you dare add a drop more of paint. Not a single more brush stroke. You leave it alone. I've just learned that from experience because if they've approved it and you add something to it and then you deliver it to them or you give it to them, 
you might have changed just with that little bit of paint you might have changed that likeness that you've captured and you don't want to do that because they would say this is not the same painting that I signed off on that I approved something's different about it so it's best just to leave it alone at that stage if somebody approves it all right so four different ways four different ways you can tell if your portrait is done and uh, I hope that helps <clears throat> now we're at this stage in, in the class and the, the class is now coming to a close uh, the portrait painting challenge continues you know unofficially now as a group it's coming to a close although we do have a few people that have just started because they couldn't get supplies right away and I want to let you know I'm here to cheer you on I'm here to encourage you I think that's also the heart of the other people in the, in the Facebook group and in the community we have online and so I'll be there to encourage you to help you and to give you support and comments on your work um, but uh, officially I guess we're drawing the the portrait painting challenge to a close with this last master class and the master class is coming to an end and I'm kind of sad to be honest with you because this has been such an intense time for me just giving everything I could in teaching the step-by-step -step process of painting a portrait you can be proud of um, from the sketch building it up shading skin tones details and then bringing it to a close here and finishing the portrait well and uh, I just want to say again thank you so much for being a part of this challenge and like they say parting is sweet sorrow <laughs> I'd like it to continue in a sense, and I just love the energy in the Facebook group and um, my online community uh, via email that emails me back and forth. And I wish it could continue, um, but in a sense it can't. But in another sense it can. In another sense it can continue. And that is going to be up to you. Um, I do want to extend an invitation, and I'm going to just give you the Cliff Notes version of this invitation. And then uh, if you stick with me here after this challenge is over, I'm going to be in contact with you and share more with you in the next few days and officially open this up. But for now, I'd just like to let you know, um, I would like to extend an invitation to you to join the membership at Realistic Acrylic Portrait School. I'd like you to become an All Access member. And you might think, well, if I become an All Access, all -access member, what what's what, what am I going to get what, what is it what is it going to do for me as an artist and um, you know again I wanted to share with you everything I could within this format of the, these lessons these master class lessons uh, within about eight hours eight to ten hours of, of instruction and unfortunately I couldn't get the whole painting process in and as this portrait stands right now um, it's not as finished as I, I would like it to be. I'd like to take it further. Say with Realistic Acrylic Portrait School, if you become an All Access member, um, you're going to be able to see several hours of bonus videos. And it's just footage that I wasn't able to upload into the Masterclass sessions just because of lack of time. And uh, just uh, some limitations that I have with, with YouTube and being able to segment videos make them easy to watch going step by step and uh, in my portrait painting school at realisticacrylic.com in the courses section everything is laid out much more step by step all right so if you join as a member uh, you will get access to seven different courses uh, where we cover all aspects of painting paint your first amazing acrylic portrait covers everything from start to finish with a lot of um, theory and application that I didn't cover in the master class, uh, different aspects, different blending techniques, printouts, downloadable guides that I didn't have available in the master class. But that's in Paint Your First Amazing Acrylic Portrait. And that was basically the, the class that started this whole thing off. I, I started that in 2017. It'll take you step by step, um, sketching, shading, building up color and depth, the whole, the whole thing. And there's also classes on shading and wrinkles and skin tones and freehand sketching. That's all at realisticacrylic.com in the courses section. Um, if you join as a member, this is the heart and soul of being an all-access member, is you have access to me as a teacher. You know, if you need additional mentorship, you need additional help, 
Um, you have a question on your portrait, man, I'm feeling stuck on this. Um, the colors are muddy, I don't know how to fix it. The sketch is off, the eyes um, are too far apart, but I can't tell how to fix them. Something isn't right on the face. Um, I just feel frustrated and, and discouraged right now. Or I just need to know the next steps. That's where I would love to help you out. Unfortunately, I can't help everybody out. You know, with the amount of emails that I get, uh, Facebook requests, I just can't comment on everyone's paintings and go as deep as I would like to in mentoring. But at the All Access membership, that's where I can go in that deeper relationship uh, where I can answer their questions specifically, do those side-by-side -side video critiques where I take your portrait and compare it to the reference photo and show you what to fix, what's working, what could use improvement, give you an encouraging word, um, and just guide you so you can get your portrait to the level where you want it and where you can get to uh, the level as an artist as you would like to be. So in the All Access membership, you have all the courses, you know, okay, and then you have um, the critiques. So the personal critiques, like I said, you can request at any time. And depending on the level of membership, you'll have certain amounts of critiques you can request per month. <coughs> Excuse me. You also have priority email. So if you just have questions and you say, hey, I just need one question answered, you shoot it to me via email. For my all access members, they can post that in the uh, chat area of the school in the, in the forum, which is kind of unofficial right now, but it comes up in the comments and I see those questions and I answer them right away. And that's another benefit of being an all access member. And then the latest thing I like to do, something brand new, is I want to do a contest. So I want to do a contest for the all access members and take, you know, just the those group of students that I have, the smaller group, and um, encourage them to participate in a challenge, or actually in a contest rather, a contest, just to make it fun. Contests are fun, right? So they'll be submitting their work into a contest and I'm going to actually have prizes, real prizes with uh, Dick Blick or Jerry's Artorama gift cards. So gift cards to art and supply stores. So you can continue <laughs> to buy paints and canvases and brushes and all that good stuff. Um, but because this contest won't be open up to a huge plethora of people, but just a limited am amount of people that I have in the membership. So I want to keep this fairly small. So you have a greater chance of winning the contest and you know, we all kind of work together as a community. So that's something fun I would like to do as well. Um, so to join the membership, I'm going to be sending you an email uh, about that very, very soon. Keep an eye out for that when I officially open it up uh, where you can join. And I'm so excited uh, to have that as an opportunity for you. It, it's not for everyone. It is for people that want to go further in their portrait painting. You want to take it to the next level um, where it's very important for you to be able to paint realistically and do this, you know, uh, either as a career or to um, give a loved one a good gift or maybe you want to paint all of your grandchildren. Um, you just, you know, have, have a goal in mind where you want to beautify your home or beautify somebody else's home uh, with the art talent that God has given you. And if that's you, if, if you want to go deeper and take your skills to the next level, I'll be happy to help you out. I've done it for many other students and I would love to do that for you. Um, that's a decision you'll have to make if it's right for you. Um, but uh, I would love to have you as a student in the All Access membership. For now though, thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of this challenge. Again, God bless you in your painting and uh, keep in touch with me. You know, you can Definitely keep in touch via email. Let me know how you're doing. Um, share your progress with me. Share on Facebook how this challenge has benefited you. Um, keep uh, finishing your portrait. If your portrait isn't done yet, keep posting it to the Facebook group. I'll be commenting on it. I'll be encouraging you. Other people will be encouraging you. And again, thank you. Thank you so much for taking this challenge. May God bless you richly in your portrait painting and just uh, do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine. And I pray that you would be blessed in every way um, and provided for God would keep you safe and healthy and bless you with abundant creativity to continue in your portrait painting.
All right, so thank you so much. Talk to you soon. God bless.